All right, welcome to Chemistry 352. Congratulations, getting through 351. This is a continuation summer term of your year-long uh, exploration of organic chemistry. I am Professor Andrus. I'll be your tour guide, your instructor, your cheerleader, your uh, counselor to help you out in this course. Uh, this does move quickly. We only have eight weeks. So we're uh, meeting, what, three times a week for two hours each day. So it'd be two videos for each day. Make sure you watch them carefully and have uh, pen and paper, take notes and follow along with the things I'm doing there. Uh, I've chosen to do YouTube videos because I think it approximates better the uh, real classroom experience. So you've got me at the chalkboard, you'll see me problem solving and doing things in real time as opposed to just clicking through a PowerPoint. We're not gonna do that. And we also, of course, have the uh, live Zoom recitations that Aaron and Ruben will be doing, your TAs. So notice that time on the schedule on Learning Suite. Everything's on Learning Suite. You see all the uh, things that we're doing activity-wise in class, and you see the URLs for, for the Zoom uh, recitations as well as my office hours. And those will happen at the times listed here on the syllabus. So looking at the syllabus, we'll, we'll go through this in some amount of detail. Um, but I expect you to learn to uh, read that on your own. There are PDF copies of both the syllabus and the schedule in Learning Suite uh, under the content file. Make sure you look at that. There's a lot of materials there, but the top one is syllabus and schedule. So there's my contact info. And you'll see uh, my office hours there, Tuesdays at 2, Thursdays at 11. That's via Zoom. Those URLs are right on uh, Learning Suite. So all you need to do is click on that. Aaron and Ruben will be helping me out with the videos, and they'll be doing the Zoom uh, time. So it doesn't matter which section that you're in. Don't worry about that. The recitations uh, just are Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 11. So zoom in, and it'll either be Ruben or Aaron uh, doing that. But organic chemistry, the chemistry of carbon. So we're continuing on with that study. Um, the one question I have is the one we had in 351. Why carbon? A whole year studying carbon chemistry? You should have some pretty good ideas now of why carbon is so universal, why there are so many compounds based on carbon, uh, why it can form so many different types of structures, chains, rings, and functional groups, and why it's so universal in biochemistry as well. In fact, we're getting into biochemistry quite a bit here in 352. So here's the schedule, the topics that you can see going through. And if you can't see this on your screen, we'll try to blow it up carefully. Again, you can follow along with the PDF version that's, that's on Learning Suite there, a separate thing. But we'll start out with uh, dienes and aromatic compounds in uh, 16, 17, and 18 here. And the reactions will be uh, with, with polyenes, 1, 2 versus 1, 4 additions benzenes and the aromatics here in 17 and then 18 we have a lot of new reactions electrophilic aromatic substitution <laughs> so we've had alkenes before of course in 351 now we're putting multiple alkenes together polyenes and aromatics so that'll be a little bit different and then uh, our next section well here's uh, test one that you can see there uh for that, and that will be multiple choice on Learning Suite. It'll be a PDF. You'll actually take uh, that exam from that PDF and fill out an answer sheet, and then you'll snap a picture of that and upload that. That'll be similar to how we're handling both homework and the uh, quizzes there. And I'll say more about that as we get closer to exam one, but notice that's only in a couple weeks here. <laughs> so things move very quickly. Uh, in summer term. Be careful about that. Don't have any other tough classes. You should only have this one uh, tough class. Um, if you're taking this and calculus and physics, uh, that's way too much. Okay, so one tough class is probably all you need there. Uh, then we'll get into carbonyl compounds. We've already looked at aldehydes and ketones as functional groups in 351, but not so much on the reactions. Now we'll get into the reactions heavily of carbonyl compounds 
uh, aldehydes, ketones, esters, amides, carboxylic acids, and their variation. You see that these next chapters here and the, 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 the reactions that'll go along with that. I'm not going through all the details of it. But then uh, exam two there, the schedule's very detailed. Uh, that's to help you and I out there uh, to keep track of things. So chapter three there. Now we're getting into the uh, to the biomolecules. You see amino acids, okay, from biology. You see peptides, proteins. Now we're into compounds and cells, living systems. A lot of you are going on to biochemistry, chem three, chem four eighty one, or molecular biology and other departments. So we will cover the basics of the organic chemistry of these biological compounds, including those amino acids, peptides, proteins, but we'll also be doing sugars, carbohydrates, uh, the other class of biomolecules, um, and then nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Yeah, we'll do uh, replication, uh, we'll do uh, uh, synthesis, DNA synthesis, we'll do uh, protein synthesis as well, translation, transcription. We'll also do fats, um, the other class of biological molecules. And then we'll do some on metabolism, glycolysis and citric acid cycle, you'll see here. We have a supplementary uh, text that's available, this McMurray that's out of part of his textbook. Our main textbook, of course, is the Smith book. It's the ebook. I sent you some instructions on that. If you've been using it before, you should be fine there and see that on Red Shelf. So that's the Smith book, edition five. And all the homework assignments are out of that edition five. If you're using an older edition, you need to get a hold of these chapter problems from edition five. And these are the assigned ones. This is how we handle the homework. So here's the ones for chapter 16. And by the way, those are due uh, this Wednesday. You only have a couple of days to read through that chapter and do those problems. And we handle it by... Chapter 16 here, you do problems 43, you see the ones that are listed, 49, 55, 59, whatever, up to 75. So it's just these problems right here. You do those on a sheet of paper, snap a picture or scan it, and upload that to Learning Suite so the graders and I can uh, grade that easily. So there's a little button there right on Learning Suite. If you haven't done it before, uh, it's very easy. You just click on that icon and then upload the file. Don't use an HIEC file from your iPhone. Make sure you convert that to a PDF or a GIF or a TIFF so that we can see it carefully. That's a, that's a thing we need to instruct you there. Um, convert those HIEC files, which are the newer iPhones. Sorry, we can't see those easily in Learning Suite. Make sure you switch it over to one of those files there. Uh, quizzes will be the same way. You saw the dates on those. Sorry, going back here. You see quiz uh, one through 10, we have 10 quizzes. Um, those will be PDFs uh, under content and learning suite. Print that out or scan it in however you need to do it and then take it by hand, write out the problems. They're open book, open notes, open help from the TAs or myself, office hours. You do it and then upload it by that date. There'll be instructions for the date of that. And I'll remind you of it. Here's the first one, quiz one, it's due Thursday. And that's mainly a review of 351, okay? So those are the problems there. Uh, we also have what's called the homework book challenge, where you do all of the even problems at the end of each chapter in a neat notebook. And if you can verify that or certify that on the final, there'll be a checkbox there. We can't turn it in and have me verify it there. If you're in a borderline grade at the end of the term, I will uh, look at your... Uh, homework book challenge with all your answers to the even problems at the end of each chapter, and I will give you that boost up. Usually it's worth about three to five raw points, okay? If you want to view it as extra credit, fine. That's just my lame way to get you to do more problems. <laughs> the more problems you do, the more practice you have, the better you're going to be prepared for the test. You've got to engage physically with the chemistry, okay? Taking notes here as you watch the videos, and uh, as you work the problems and, and read in the chapters, the more you can do that, the better. I should say something about study habits and time here. The recommendation from our department is for each hour spent in class or hour watching a video, uh, you should spend two to three hours studying and preparing the material. So whether that's homework or reading or whatever, 
Um, so what does that come out? Uh, spring, summer term, that's six hours of class each week, right? Two hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that's what, 12 to 18 hours. So this is like a full-time or part-time <laughs> heavy job here to take this course. So uh, it's quite a big commitment, we say. All right. For each chapter, I'll have an outline. You may not be able to see that detail. It's also under course content. I summarize very succinctly all the key concepts you need to know, including the reactions. Those are all there. I'll show those when we start each video. There's my one page um, resume. You can see some of the stuff I do. I'm a synthetic chemist. We make molecules. We have a lab with grad students, whatever, and some of the, the papers there. Okay, how do you succeed? Uh, is it easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle, or is it easier to get an A in OCHEM? Well, some of you think, well, both are impossible, right? No, okay, uh, you can do this. Here's me playing around with a printer uh, years ago. I, I don't look that stressed out now, maybe. I don't know, <laughs> sometimes. But you know how to, how to succeed in chemistry, right? There's some patterns here. And everybody's different. Everybody has a different approach. But, you know, reading ahead, staying ahead of me, taking good notes, focusing on the principles. Don't try to memorize everything. You've got to rely on the core principles to keep chemistry straight. Work the problems without looking at the answers right away. OK, struggle a little bit, go back to the principles, go back to the section in the chapter and then work it. Uh, zoom into recitation, get help from Aaron and Ruben and myself and we'll help you out there. Uh, study group, participate with some other people. You can do that electronically. We've helped you out with that. You can see the contact info of other people or in Zoom, you can set that up with other people too. Make outlines, flashcards, and use models, physical models. So some other things that are helpful, and you know about that already. Why is OCHEM important? Why carbon? Well, I've discussed this. If you had me for 351 or you've got a flavor of that from your 351 class, whatever, there's three main things here. Improving processes, engineers, and applied sciences. Yeah, all the good things in life that makes modern uh, life possible and enjoyable is mainly due to organic chemistry all the nice products that we enjoy, everything around us. Uh, you can see organic chemistry being involved there. Uh, basic scientists in, uh, are involved in developing new products and new processes, understanding things at a, at a fundamental level that allows us to manipulate systems and to create new things. There's also a political component, cleaning up messes, uh, global warming and uh, pollution and all those kinds of things. Those are also solved by chemists. Chemistry, as you know, uh, like all science, it's a matter of size. Chemistry, we're focused on this very small niche right here of molecules, right? So the dimensions here are nanometers or angstroms, 10 to the minus 10 meters. Can't see them with the naked eye. We need to use spectroscopy. But imagine the profound effects here of these very small objects have on cells, which are much larger. And of course, cells impact what? Larger animals and plants that are much larger scale. And, you know, this is this kind of have the big stuff here, uh, the dimensions here, the galaxy, universe, solar systems, very huge objects. And then the very small, the subatomic particles, quarks, muons, uh, bosons, and all those kinds of things. We don't deal with that. We deal with electrons, neutrons, protons making up the atoms. The atoms combine to make molecules, okay? But there's consequences all along the way of that scale, the size of matter. So again, carbon, central question today. Why carbon? <laughs> so you've probably remembered a few things here. If you want to think about that for a minute, even pause the video. Why carbon? Why a whole year of, of organic chemistry? Is it just because your major program told you you have to do it or get ready for the MCAT or the DAT? No, this is an important consequences of carbon and what it's about. Mainly it's due to what? Four valence electrons here allow us to form four covalent bonds and that's a closed shell species now, right? Those are the eight electrons around that central carbon. Once it forms the four covalent bonds sharing those electrons, and that satisfies the octet rule. At that quantum level, that electron shell is filled and stabilized because of that arrangement. Other atoms nearby, it's a little bit different. Oxygen has six valence electrons. That can form two bonds, but it leaves behind two lone pairs. And that's fine. There's a lot of functional groups with oxygen, but there are no long chains and rings that are inherently stable like carbon. That's a different arrangement. Why is that? 
Well, if you have chains and rings of oxygen, you'd have those lone pairs uh, repelling each other and weakening those bonds. In fact, an oxygen-oxygen bond peroxide is a very uh, weakly held molecule. It's a very reactive molecule. It's a strong oxidant peroxide. Maybe you've bleached your hair with that, whatever. But uh, oxygen's not a good player for chains and rings. Nitrogen, similarly, five analytes electrons. That's three bonds and then one lone Oh, pair. Hydrogen's kind of boring there, just one valence electron, just one bond, but we see a lot of consequences to that, right? There's a lot of carbon, hydrogen bonding hydrocarbons to go on there. Now, carbon has different bonding characteristics. You should review this if you don't remember this. I have a lot of review mirror tutorials for Chem 351. You can look at that in Learning Suite. Uh, here's the different shapes, right? The fundamental shapes here. We've got sp3 hybridization, where all Four atomic orbitals for carbon are mixed together to form the four equivalent sp3 orbitals, right? This is saturated carbon that has the bond angles of 109.5, right? This is a three-dimensional object, a tetrahedron. And then if we have bonding to just three things, we need a double bond to one thing here. Okay, that's trigonal planar bonding for carbon, where it's sp2 hybridization for all the sigma bonds, and there's a pi bond left behind. We need to review that. You need to know where in 3D space that pi bond is found. So let me grab my models here, and you can kind of review that. So if we've got a double bond between carbon, <laughs> uh, we'll go over to the sideboard in a minute. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, keep it back up here. <laughs> That's fine. Let me keep going through this. So yeah, sp2, uh, sp, if it's uh, a triple bond, and that's uh, what, bond angles of 120, uh, 180, and 109.5. So yeah, make sure you review that, and we'll, we'll get into that on the sideboard here in a second. But here's the uh, consequences of this type of bonding, right? Carbon can form these chains, these extended hydrocarbon chains there, can go on for hundreds or thousands of atoms. Uh, all the alkanes that you study in 351. Or it can come back and form rings. We've got uh, cyclohexane with the chair conformation here. And then if we have uh, bonding to three different things, we have a double bond here with ethylene or with a ketone here with acetone. And we've got what? These carbons here involved in the double bond are what? Sp2 hybridized. So remember that. And we could put this together with a combination of functional groups, things like penicillin. We've got a lot of functional groups. Let's see if you can review some of your functional groups. Which one's this right here? Yep, that's an amide. And right here, yeah, that's another amide. <laughs> How about that functional group right there? That's a carboxylic acid. And we've got a sulfide right here. And then aromatic. That'll be the topic coming up in chapter 17 and 18, uh, benzene. You've seen those before. Uh, the resonance structures, but we'll get into the reactivity of benzene coming up. So a lot of materials, so here are the applications of OCHEM. You've seen some of these before. I'm just going to click through these very briefly. You can look through them in detail if you'd like later. Uh, cellulose we'll see later on with sugar chemistry coming up. Conducting materials, polyenes, polyacetylene, metallic looking compound. There's no metal involved there, but it has a metal sheen to it because it has a delocalized electrons due to the resonance effect there. Polyaniline, liquid crystal, all the display uh, things that we enjoy on our computer screens and our watches and everywhere else are all based on these uh, compounds that change colors based on very weak, small electric fields, uh, liquid crystals. Flavors, fragrances, what's not to like there? You got everything from vanillin, from vanilla, to muscone, skatol, capsaicin, the hot pepper compound, spartame, artificial sweetener, L-heptanoate, that's the essence of banana. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of stuff there. Herbicides, pesticides, you've probably used some of these, maybe uh, Roundup in the garden there, glyphosate, uh, chrysanthemic acid from chrysanthemum flowers, limonene from uh, lemons, some others. Drugs, so I show a lot of these and we'll refer to a lot of drugs as we go through the course. Uh, you've probably seen some of these. Uh, you've taken a lot of these probably. Aspirin right here, penicillin. Uh, hopefully not all of these compounds. Cocaine, methamphetamine, hopefully you're leaving that alone. 
Uh, morphine, you've probably taken different derivatives of uh, opioid uh, drugs for different applications. But you see, some of these more modern drugs get quite complicated. A lot of stereo centers, a lot of functional groups. And uh, we'll relate some of that uh, to the things we're talking about from an application point of view. Chirality, don't forget about that. Stereo centers can be either R or S. Those are enantiomeric forms. Uh, and we'll review those things in a couple spots. Molecules of life, I've mentioned this. We will have separate chapters on amino acids, uh, carbohydrates, sugars, uh, fats, lipid materials, and then DNA, nucleic acids, with the uh, combination of the uh, ribose sugar and the, uh, and the bases, ATGC, on the side. The genetic code is based on organic chemistry, of course. Structure of that, we'll get into the double helix, the hydrogen bonding a pattern you're probably familiar with, but you'll see the molecular basis of it. You know, things that we'll need to cover there will be relatively simple and straightforward from a molecular biology point of view, but the structure is what we'll relate things on. Amino acids come together to make peptides and proteins, steroids. Uh, we'll look at some of those and the different functional groups and how those are changed from cholesterol to the to the different ones are vision. Uh, so this is an important topic, and this fits into Chapter 16, actually. The polyenes, here's beta carotene. Yes, your mom was right there. Eat your carrots. You see all these conjugated alkenes here. There's a bunch of them all along there. And this uh, allows, because of this resonance, for the electronic excitation to drop down into the visible uh, region here. You can see that these absorb different colors in the electromagnetic spectrum, which is in the, uh, the visible range. In fact, these are the different type of proteins involved in the vision process. Opsin is the name of the protein. Forms a covalent bond with retinal, which comes from beta carotene. And this is in the eyeball back here in the, uh, the retina area, the cone and the rod cells. This covalent complex right here actually harvests the photon of light as it comes into your eyeball. And it has these different types of proteins that absorb in these different ranges of visible light. And uh, this light harvesting, H nu, stands for the photon, the light particle as it actually comes into your eye. That's a picosecond event, happens very quickly. 10 to the minus uh, 12 uh, seconds, very fast process. Switching from the Z or the cis conformation right here to the E geometry. And that conformational change impinges on the optical nerve. It changes the conformation of that protein that's uh, linked, of course, to a neuron that goes into your brain. And that creates the vision that you actually see within your mind. This is recycled here. This aminium ion, we'll learn about aminium ions later on uh, to aldehydes, happens very quickly also. And that loads up again and allows you to harvest more photons as they come into your eyeball. So we know, know a lot about the mechanisms of the organic chemistry of how that's involved, but we know basically nothing about how the mind actually creates the vision that you see in your mind there. Glycolysis, metabolism, we will do some of that. Citric acid, metabolism later on. How do chemists make things? Well, we synthesize things. If you had the lab course, a lot of you will have to take 353. You'll learn uh, more about this and the techniques that go along with that. You see NMR featured prominently here, how we figure out the structure of different things and, and what goes on there. History of Ochem, uh, I won't get into that, but uh, maybe I'll mention some things later on as those uh, topics come up. Here's a more modern thing, the antiviral compound Tamiflu. Some of you may have taken this. Antivirals, of course, an important topic nowadays with the COVID uh, infection. That's a different type of virus. This is a drug developed for uh, influenza infections, the, uh, the flu process Tamiflu is a breakthrough drug that inhibits the fusion of the virus with the host cell um, and uh, shuts down the infection. And it's made using a Diels-Alder reaction, which we'll go over here in chapter 16. Here's the Diels-Alder reaction. Butadiene with this alkene ester forming cyclohexene. Okay, so I'll refer back to that later. It's obviously many more steps to make the actual drug, but you'll see how the uh, deals all works. Anyway, to review study habits for this course, <laughs> uh, 
there's how you guys look right now. You're dressed for success. You look sharp, right? You're confident. You know what you're doing because you've been doing that stuff, studying hard, homework. Uh, you've had an approach to uh, review the material in your notes, whatever. If you're not doing those things, that's how you're going to look at the end of the term, okay? That's how I look at the end of every uh, term right there at the bottom uh, left. But uh, you're not going to look like that, right? Because you're going to be doing that study stuff. Okay, here's how OCHEM works. There's three main ideas. If you had me for 321, you already know this, right? The main thing you need to keep straight in chemistry, OCHEM in particular, is structure. We just reviewed a little bit with hybridization, right? SP3, SP2, SP, you know, the tetrahedral, trigonal planar, the linear with SP. Those topics you need to have down very well, okay, for the basic structure, because that relates the shape, the properties of the molecule, and important reactivity. So the next thing is reactivity. A plus B goes to C. What starting materials go to what product? You need to know that. And in each chapter, we have that set of new reactions we're learning. But don't just memorize those reactions. Relate those to the principles of structure and the properties of, of OCHEM. Okay, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. And then the next thing is mechanism, pushing the electrons, moving that pair of electrons to form the reactive intermediates. We'll mainly be looking at electrophilic substitution here, the first couple of things. So we have an electron deficient reagent that's partially positive. We'll flow electrons out of the pi bond or the benzene ring and attack the electrophile, okay? But the three levels of understanding you need to keep straight. So if you've got structure down, you'll be okay. A plus B going to C for reactivity. And then where are the electrons and where do they go? They always go from a filled orbital to an empty orbital. We'll need to look at molecular orbitals a little bit. Here's some of my review materials for 351. The final for our class, 352, will be comprehensive over both semesters, 351 and 352. So you need to re remember your 351 concepts. And I'll build on those reactions. I'll review some of those reactions and point those out. Our quiz one here uh, will be uh, based on uh, review reactions from 351. But here's some of the summary of reactions. Uh, substitution reactions, eliminations reactions, SN2, uh, E2, and those type of reactions. So a lot of these are reviewed right here, and you can look through those materials uh, to help yourself out. Uh, if, if you're not clear on that, your ebook has those earlier chapters, so go back and look at that. The main functional groups we looked at in 351 were alcohols and halides, but we could form a lot of different products from that, right? So review some of these reactions. Some are new here. We haven't covered uh, Grignard reactions, the magnesium reactions, but we will in 352. So not all these things are stuff you've already learned. Here's the addition reactions to alkenes, addition electrophilic bimolecular reactions. You're probably not familiar with that de depiction, but that's what these were from 351. Uh, these electrophilic, so here's hydrochlorination, HCl with an alkene. Here's hydration reaction, here's uh, hydroboration. So some of these you should be familiar with, you should be able to go through and review some of those things. Stereochemistry is very important, the consequences of the mechanism, how the reagent interacts with the starting material, the substrate transforms into product. Uh, we have some stereochemical consequences. We're creating stereocenters a lot of times. We need to keep track of those, especially in a relative sense. Uh, regioselectivity as well, Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov addition to alkenes. Those are topics you should remember also. Alkyne reactions uh, are very similar to alkene reactions. Those are just some of those. Uh, they're the uh, oxidations and the uh, hydrogenation reaction. Radical reactions was what, chapter 15? as we wrapped up 351 in the Smith book. And here's a review of those reactions you keep track of. Okay, how do we correlate all this? Not gonna memorize it all, no way. You're gonna drive yourself nuts trying to just brute force memorize things. Uh, none of us have a good enough memory to do that. We need to rely on the principles. So, you know, you gotta back up and think about valence electrons, where things are, and electronegativity, right? What's the propensity of that atom to pull those electrons toward itself? 
Okay, that's the Pauling scale. That electronegativity goes from zero to four, right? Fluorine's the most electronegative atom we know because it wants one more electron to get the octet, right? So any bonding with fluorine will create a very polar covalent bond there. Carbon, not so much. Hydrogen, not so much. They're kind of in the middle. And again, that's one of the reasons why carbon compounds are so stable and so universal and uh, flexible that way is because of that intermediate electronegativity. Bonding, we just reviewed a little bit about that. Oh, here's our friend, the pi bond for ethylene. Yeah, I was pulling out my model there, but you can see it uh, right here. We have sp2 hybridization, right? So these sigma bonds to the two hydrogens and over here to the carbon, those are the sigma bonds. And the sigma bond, what? Has the electron density located uh, on the axis, right in between the two atoms involved. Pi bond is different though, right? The pi bonds from the leftover P atomic orbitals, and if they're in phase here, that creates a pi bond, the sideways interaction for the other two electrons that are left behind. So a double bond has a total of four bonds being shared between the two carbons, right? Triple bond just has the two pi bonds and the sigma, don't forget about that. So you need to know where those bonds are, and that's important. That's fundamental for understanding the reactions moving forward. And then we got uh, polarity, dipole moment, partial charges that will affect the reactivity and how we think about reactions. And resonance, delocalization, not only of the uh, intermediates that are formed, but also the starting materials. We can see a carbonyl, the electrons are polarized out of the pi bond toward the more electronegative oxygen. If you put that extra lone pair on this oxygen, you have an O minus right there. That renders this as cationic. So any nucleophile is gonna to wanna to attack this point of those type of uh, functional groups. So that's important to keep straight. Then we got acid base equilibrium stuff, uh, the propensity of transferring a proton from an acid to a base, and then generating what? The conjugate base and the conjugate acid. There's equilibrium involved there, the pKa's. And that has to do with the stability of those species. And we can look at resonance structures and electronegativity to figure that out as well. Reactions pushing electrons. There's your old friend, the SN2 reaction, right? Uh, to form this uh, ether right here. So the nucleophiles, ethoxide, OE, so there's an ethyl group here on O minus. The sodium ethoxide reacting with ethyl chloride and the uh, electrons go from the filled orbital here, the lone pair, attacking the partially positive carbon and then pushing the chloride off as Cl minus, right? Then we have energy diagrams to talk about that, how favorable a reaction will be, what's the free energy change here, delta G. That's the difference in energy between the starting materials and the product. If this is going down here in energy, it's more stable. We say it's what? Exothermic. It's releasing heat as it goes there. What's this point here? That's the transition state where you have to change the geometry and the organization of the electrons being transformed from the starting material product. It doesn't just go downhill directly. It's got to go over this mountain peak, right? This transition state. It's got to organize itself geometrically and electronically to, to get there. We call that the transition state. That has to do with the rate. The higher this transition state, the slower that rate. If this is lower, if there are factors that lower or stabilize this transition state, that'll make the reaction faster, okay? So we'll look at a lot of intermediates there to talk about that. Again, here's uh, chapter 16. Well, before we get into that, the details of it, let's see if I can go over here to the sideboard and we'll move the camera over and we'll go through... Uh, some reactions here. In fact, I'll try to summarize all the reactions for this course <laughs> for Chem 352. Let's see, can I do all of them here? Uh, let's see. So we've already been talking about why carbon. You should have a pretty good idea of, about that right now. But now what are the reactions we're gonna cover here in, uh, in this course? Well, let's start out with one reaction that you already know here, HCl going to uh, ethyl chloride there. How does this reaction work? Let's do a little on the mechanism. So yeah, the HCl is an acid, so it can donate that proton. And what does it do? Once it donates that proton, 
we have a carbocation. That's a primary carbocation. That's a pretty bad one. But you can finish the reaction here with the chloride coming in and going to the product. So that's a reaction we're familiar with, 351. Uh, now we're just going to add two alkenes together. We've got butadiene, one, three butadiene, double bond here and here, and we've got four carbons. So it's very similar to an alkene. So this is the difference between 351 and 352. Now we have polyenes, but we still have HCl or HBr. We still have our proton source. So what are we going to do there? Mechanistically, let's just go ahead and protonate this thing. But let's protonate it in such a way that we get the Markovnikov cation, right? <laughs> we want to put the electrophile on the end carbon to give the more stabilized carbocation. But now we have a choice here. We can either attack with the bromide directly on this carbocation and get this product, right? We call that the 1-2 product. But notice our intermediate here has the carbocation right here, and we can resonate, we say. And I'll draw a double-headed arrow for that resonance. <laughs> we'll review these topics in the next uh, class, don't worry. If we can push these electrons over here, because these two pi bonds are communicating, right? Is this really a single bond here? Double bond, single bond, double bond. Or is there some double bond character here? You can see that this can resonate over. And what? Have the cation, not just at the primary position, but we can also, or at the secondary, sorry, we've drawn the secondary there. Primary position here. And look, that will give us a different product then. If we attack the bromide the same way, we can get, instead of the 1, 2, we can get the 1, 4 product. <laughs> So we've got some complexity here in 352 when we've got polyenes. We've got multiple alkenes together. So that's the key reaction for <laughs> chapter uh, 16. Uh, we'll, we'll see the details of this. This will be the low temperature reaction. This will be the high temperature. This will be the kinetic product, the thermodynamic product, we'll call that. We'll have to relate it to energies, whatever. OK, some more thing here with benzene. Benzene is just what? A six membered ring with three alkenes around there. Similar thing with electrophiles here. Our electrophile up there was just the proton H. We're going to have five different electrophiles here in chapter 18. And we're going to do what's called electrophilic aromatic substitution. We're going to add here, we're going to form an intermediate that'll look like this. It'll still have that hydrogen there. I'm not drawing all six hydrogens out there. This is a similar type of intermediate we see up here and, and back to the alkene thing from 351. We've got a carbocation intermediate as we add the electrophile. And now what? Something is going to take off this proton and allow us to form uh, the benzene product. So that will be electrophilic aromatic substitution. So we've just gone through three chapters. <laughs> We won chapter 16, 17, and 18. Those are the fundamental ideas. You keep these things straight. That will be a roadmap to really help you out. Okay, let's see if we can do the rest of the term. Okay. Ah, we already looked at this type of molecule, carbonyl compound. So carbon, oxygen, double bond. There's a lot of functional groups that have carbonyls, right? Aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids, amides. But what's characteristic here is what? This carbon is the partially positive one. Because again, we have a resonance structure there that's meaningful, that looks like this. I just pushed a pair of electrons out of this pi bond, and I put what? That third lone pair on oxygen, okay? So go back to your Lewis dots and make sure you know where all those electrons are. This resonance form right here is the important one when we talk about nucleophilic addition. So we'll have a lot of different nucleophiles adding to carbonyl compounds, and they'll add at the carbon. And they'll give this type of product, or intermediate, we should say. And if we, in a second step, dilute with acid or, or expose the thing once it's over to water, we'll get this type of product. So we'll make alcohols. 
with new bonds made between different nucleophilic species. We'll have carbon nucleophiles, hydrogen nucleophiles, and heteroatom nucleophiles, so oxygen and nitrogen. So this is uh, chapters uh, uh, 19, moving forward 20. I'll <laughs> we'll have a lot of variations of, of that type of thing. Let's see. We've got a couple more here. Get a little more space. See what other reactions we're going to have here. Well, if we treat a carbonyl compound first with a strong base, and we'll look at different types of bases, we'll have to review the pKa's and what type of base we could have. So we're not uh, adding something that's a good nucleophile around there. We're adding something that's a strong base. So it's going to have to be hindered. Uh, LDA will be a good base, lithium, disopropyl amide, a TB toxide, some other bases. But we'll have to, you know, compare pKa's. The pKa uh, at the alpha position to a ketone is about 20 pKa. So that'll, that'll come back into play there. We're going to have to have a base that has a, what, a conjugate acid that's uh, stronger than that, has a higher number. And LDA certainly does. And if you do that, it won't add to the carbonyl, it'll just take the proton off. And by taking the proton off, it'll generate the carbanion, okay? And that intermediate is again, resonance stabilized. Look at that. So this resonance effect will be a very important thing. To keep straight for a lot of reactions we'll be looking at in 352. That resonance there stabilizes this anion because look, the negative charge is not just on carbon here. It's up on oxygen. And then we can react this with an electrophile. <laughs> and then what do we get? We get a different substitution pattern. We get, instead of addition to the carbonyl, we get a reaction on the side of the carbonyl. So there'll be a lot of other reactions to look at. But notice the difference between the nucleophilic addition to carbonyl versus the deprotonation and then the electrophilic addition there. Okay, um, that's probably enough. All the others kind of fall out of that. The main one with uh, sugar chemistry, and this one looks kind of funny, but sugars are just uh, polyalcohol aldehydes. We'll have a lot of other alcohols on the side of a sugar molecule, but the aldehyde on the end here and the alcohols can participate in what's called an acetal reaction. And I'm not going to draw all the details of it right now, but you see your old friend, uh, the chair, <laughs> cyclohexane, but now we have an oxygen in the, in the ring. So the rings will be there also in 352. And this is like a nucleophilic addition here, pushing the electrons. And I'm not showing the whole mechanism. We need to transfer this hydrogen to this oxygen now. So there's another step here. But this is called the acetal. And that's the key thing for sugar chemistry, uh, looking forward. The key thing on uh, Amino acid and peptide chemistry, protein chemistry will be the nucleophilic addition to form amide bonds. I won't review that right now, but uh, that will relate to that. And then sugar chemistry is related to uh, DNA and RNA. But these main things are the, the things we're going to keep straight there uh, to uh, go through that. All right, let's look at alkenes in a little more detail. If we could come back over here <laughs> to look at the outline. Thank you. Um, we're trying a few new things with the videos this time and hopefully the, the quality and everything you can see. All of my overhead graphics are also under course content on Learning Suite. So anything you see up here on the board is, is already on Learning Suite. So here's the outline in more detail that I just wanted to show real quick before we get into the details maybe next time. Uh, we've got alkenes. We'll need to talk about polyenes now. We've already shown you how they're acting here. This is butadiene, a little bit on the nomenclature of alkenes. So this is one, two, three position. And this is from butane and butadiene. And then one, three, where the alkenes start there, give you that. Uh, if you have an alkene and an adjacent position with something on it, that's called the allylic position. If you're right on the alkene, that's called the vinyl position. So you've probably heard those two terms before. So we have things like allyl alcohols and vinyl alcohols and allyl halides, vinyl halides. So a little bit on the common terminology there. Um, allylic cations, resonance. I already showed you a little bit about that. Next time we'll look at the molecular orbitals of that. And the molecular orbitals are just 
combinations of the atomic orbitals. We'll mainly be looking at the p atomic orbitals and how those create the molecular orbitals with multiple uh, pi bonds coming together. So here's the allocation. Uh, so there's a p atomic orbital each, each spot there. You can kind of see these two electrons are in this atomic orbital here. Okay. We'll look at the details of that. Resonance, we'll get into a little more details on that. Uh, conjugated dienes, you already see what those are. They're right next to each other. We'll have isolated dienes also, which are not conjugated. There's an intervening saturated carbon. And we also have allenic uh, accumulated alkenes where they're right next to each other. Uh, I'll summarize that here in a second. But examples, you've already seen one, carotene there. There's some others coming up. Bonding stability, uh, generally the resonance effect with polyenes, if they're right next to each other, makes them more stable. Okay, so we've got some uh, other reactions here. We've got the 1-2 uh, versus 1-4 addition. I've already given you a flavor of that. We'll go into more details of that next time. And Diels Alder in a future uh, thing is the reaction of a diene with a dienophile. Usually the dienophile here has an electron withdrawing group, which makes it more deficient. And the uh, the butadiene part of the reaction, the, the diene part, is the electron rich thing. So you have electron rich with electron deficient. And you just push the electrons around the ring and you make a very useful cyclohexene product. And you have some stereochemical consequences of, of that as well that are important. So to wrap up lecture uh, today, let's just go back to the chalkboard real quick and we'll uh, review a couple things. I'll talk about this next time and go through the rest of the overheads on that. But let's go back to the chalkboard right now um, and see uh, what these two terms are here. So dienes. So <clears throat> chapter 16, first thing, a little bit on nomenclature. So this comes from butane. Uh, and we take the E off, buta, we take the N off, buta diene. So to convert it the name wise, we take the N E off of the parent. So whatever the longest chain is, that comes from butane, right? So you're familiar with that. We just change the suffix, the N part here. So we minus the N E part and we added the diene part. But we need to specify where we're at here. So starting on one end here, one, three. Uh, that's where we, we get to that. Okay, we call this a conjugated uh, diene. We can look at the structure of it, and we see here's one pi bond here, right? We can even shade it there. And here's the other one right here, okay? To have resonance, to have them right next to each other. So the next one starts on the adjacent carbon to be a conjugated diene now. Uh, and you can see we've got some overlap here. And that's kind of a question. Keep that in mind for the next class period. We'll, we'll answer the effect there. We'll look at some bond lengths and some consequences of reactivity. Is there some double bond character? We draw it as a single bond, right? You see double bond here and here. But there you see a single bond. But look at the structure. It looks more like a double bond, right? So keep, some, keep it in mind there. Uh, let's look at this one where we've got... Uh, what would this? This would be one, two, four, five. This is pentadiene, penta, right? Pentadiene, the same suffix there. Penta, take the N-E off. But now what is our number? One, two, three, four. So this is one, four pentadiene. Is this also a conjugated diene? No, notice this carbon right here is saturated. This has an intervening sp3 hybridized carbon. So these two are not electronically communicating with each other. <laughs> they all have different type of reactivity than the conjugated one. Okay, so what do we call this type of diene here? This we call an isolated diene. Okay, so we've got conjugated dienes where they're right next to each other, isolated dienes where there's an intervening uh, group right there. Okay, is there another one? <laughs> yeah, we've got cumulated <laughs> dienes also, okay. That's kind of a funny word, cumulated. So can we have one, two uh, butadiene? <laughs> so we've kept everything the same here, butadiene. But look, the numbering now is one, two, not one, three. One, three is the, is the conjugated one. What does one, two look like? Well, it's this. 
right? <laughs> so it looks kind of funny. This carbon right here in the middle, there's two double bonds right next to each other. So that's the term cumulated. So here's the one position. Here's the two position where the next one starts. There's still one, two, three, four carbons, right? But these, are these resonance conjugated with each other? What, is, what does this look like? Let's see. So let's draw the first one. There it is, you know. We've got the hydrogens, you know, one in the back, one in the front here. But then where does this one start here? Well, you've got this next one right here, right? You've got the pi bond right there. That's the one pi bond between the one and the two position. And then between the two and the three position, you've got this right here. And this is what hybridization, the central carbon? It only has two things bonded to it, so what is it? That's right, it's sp hybridized, okay? Which means what? It's only bonded to two things, and it means what? There's one p orbital right here, and there's one p orbital right there. They're perpendicular to each other. Remember, that's what the term p orbitals mean. They're all mutually perpendicular. So here's the sigma bonds, right, that are with your sp hybridization. But now what's left behind here are the p atomic orbitals, right? And this creates this cumulated effect. But look, they're perpendicular to each other, right? That's 180 degrees to each other. So electronically, this alkene here and this alkene here do not communicate. There's a node right here at the, at the atom. So unlike the resonance stabilized conjugated ones, where they're right next to each other here being 1,3, those are resonance conjugated. The uh, isolated, no resonance between the two, and also cumulated, <laughs> no resonance. So there's kind of the bottom line on the structure, and I think we'll leave it there. We've, we've tortured you enough here in the first <laughs> class time. But keep these ideas straight, and we'll pick it up right there. We're good at reactivity, so make sure you're reading ahead and, and, and studying for that. You can watch the next video right away if you've taken good notes here. But uh, we'll see you next time in the next hour uh, for this Monday. Both of these videos, these first two, are for Monday, June 22nd. So we'll pick it up right there. All right. See you next time.